Welcome to Live Let Thrive, a podcast about the Airbnb life, the share economy, and everything in between. Here are your hosts, Micah and Steve. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome back to another exciting episode of Live Let Thrive. <laughs> episode 121? Is it 121? Yeah, 121, man. We had some we had some Micah uh, quickie episodes in, in between, but yeah, official episode 121 of your favorite Airbnb, VRBO, Home Away, Turo, Live, Share Economy podcast in the world. Yes, sir. And we're back, you know, to give you all that knowledge and we have a special guest. Yes, we have a special guest, Ethan Cook, on today. And we are bringing Ethan Cook on from, I believe, the Bay Area, right? San Francisco. You got it. Cool. All right, so Ethan, um, first let's just get your backstory before we hop into the madness that's going on right now. So, how how did you get involved in short term rentals, corporate rentals? How did you get involved in that? Yeah, so I uh, I worked in corporate America for like twenty five years as an HR director, and that stopped working for me. And uh, while I was working my day job, my wife and I had bought a couple investment properties here in the Bay Area. And we also um, would Airbnb our house for like a week at a time when we went on family vacations. And it was, it was awesome because, you know, if you have a house in San Francisco and you're renting it out, you can basically go anywhere without a plane ticket and like make money during your vacation. So uh, that was a really nice way to just pick up some extra income and, and uh, take advantage of the uh, kind of the early days of the sharing economy. And then when I got out of corporate America, I thought, I love real estate. I love investing. I don't mind being a landlord. I love hosting. What can I do with this to really make a career out of it? And so working with a mutual mentor of ours, Al Williamson, and another guy named Jay Martin, who had really successful Airbnb rental arbitrage businesses, I rented a home down the street from me because I knew the market and knew what I could get for my own place renting it out. And, uh, you know, started renting it out fully furnished to business travelers, was successful with that, and then just started picking up a, about a unit a month after that. And, and it's, it was history from there. And that was about two and a half years ago. Wow. Nice. How many units did you get? Uh, I'm up to about 25. Nice. And are, are, you, are all your 25 still all in the Bay Area? They are, yeah. Um, I have a handful in San Francisco, a couple in San Jose. And then the rest are all in between in San Mateo County within about 10 miles of SFO airport. And what, and what kind of units do you look for? One bedroom, two bedrooms? Uh, you know, my biggest, my most successful units, and this is kind of part of my secret sauce, which I'll share with anyone who will listen, is uh, I go for typically two and three unit homes. So like I'll look for a home that has an in-law unit. Because a lot of landlords, a lot of mom and pop landlords, to them, it's just like a five bedroom property with a, with three bathrooms. To me, it's two or three units where there's maybe a main unit with three bedrooms, two baths, and then one or two studio units. Um, And I find that I, I make the biggest margins on these kind of small multi units, if you will. Okay. I see. And see, Mike has always been talking about that, getting a bigger house and renting it out, you know, kind of separating it out room by room and stuff like that. And that would kind of even help make it recession proof. If that's even a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly um, kind of my core philosophy in real estate is that everyone always needs affordable housing, right? Whatever that means. I'm, I'm not talking about low income housing per se, but if you own affordable housing and you can rent it out to people, whether it's furnished or unfurnished, you know, affordable housing in San Francisco means that four people live in a house and pay a thousand dollars each for rent. And that's really affordable around here (laughs) as crazy as it sounds. And you, you know, you just use the same principle with Airbnb. So if you can rent a place for uh, at or below market value, split it into a couple of units, furnish it, then you're adding natural value on top of, already having a place which is above market rent unfurnished. So I'm, I'm kind of just now, we can get into this later, but I'm just now having to fall back on kind of that fundamental, uh, fundamental belief and fundamental strength of 
having rental properties at or below market value. So you're operating 25 units and probably one, one of the most expensive areas in the United States right now. Yeah. Uh, how, how, did you, how did you go about automating those 25 units and automating the process of it? Uh, I will be really honest. Automation is not my strength. I'm kind of a one man show and it's really only now that I'm needing to market the heck out of my properties and t- and not just kind of rely on a lot of easy Airbnb bookings, but needing to market all over the place and needing to um, automate my accounting and stuff like that, that I'm really getting into it. But I'll tell you some of the things that I'm learning now that I'm really diving into it are use channel managers. So if you've got a bunch of short-term rental units, you know, use something like Guesty or your Porter. You pay a, a, a Guesty is a little more expensive, but they're great. You pay a little bit for each unit per month. You blast it out through one website and then they post it automatically to 20 different furnished rental websites. All the big ones like Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway, Booking.com, um, and so on, and then they synchronize the pricing, synchronize the calendars. So that's a, a huge time saver that I'm just now implementing. And then if you have long-term rentals that you want to rent out, there are long-term rental syndicators. You know, property management software like um, Rentlinks and uh, the one I'm just started using, Turbo Tenant, um, which basically does the same thing across many long-term rental websites. So you post the listing once. It goes out to Zillow. It goes out to Trulia Hotpads. Uh, you can even cut and paste some stuff onto Craigslist and cover, uh, you know, Apartments.com and cover most of those long-term rental websites. So that's been a really new and uh, but very important part of my new uh, coronavirus marketing strategy. Yeah, you get, <laughs> you got to step up your game in this environment. Huh? Yeah. yeah. What, what, was, what was the name of that? Of which one? The the oh the uh, so one of them that I'm using is Turbo Tenant, and that's that that's free. And then another one that uh, some some colleagues of mine who run actually a very automated uh, Airbnb business they use one called Rentlinks. Okay. Yeah, it's R E N T L I N X. Okay. Now, so you brought it up the coronavirus. So uh, I'm happy you brought it up because I know that's what everyone wants to hear about. Yeah, yeah. People are really, it's taking its toll on a lot of people. A lot of people. Could, could I ask him something, one thing first before we dive into Corona? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Because I want to ask, because I know that S, uh, San Francisco was, was really um, hit y'all strong with some strong anti Airbnb laws. So that was uh, obviously your first challenge before this Corona thing. How did you, how did you handle that one? Yeah, so San Francisco has a one month minimum rental unless it's your primary unless it's your primary home and then you can get a short-term rental license for it. So I have a short-term rental license for my own home, but I only rent it out, you know, four, four or five weeks a year for the other properties. I'm doing a, I've always been doing a one month minimum here in San Francisco. So really my San Francisco Airbnb strategy hasn't changed much. I'm still looking for those medium to long-term renters for at least 30 days. What's changed is the marketing strategy because I need to, push out my properties in a lot more places to get better visibility because I'm competing for a much smaller pool of travelers and tenants right now. Mm. Uh, and then that the, because of the 30 day minimum in San Francisco, that's really why I've chosen to focus in San Mateo County, just South of San Francisco around the airport where most of those small cities don't have the same short term rental restrictions that San Francisco has. Oh, nice. Nice. That's good to know. So we, we could center you've been doing that. Uh, you, you, how, how dependent was your business upon like an OTA like Airbnb? Oh, extremely dependent. I was getting like 85% of my bookings through Airbnb and I was at 90 to 95% occupancy. So yeah, I, I had a, I had a good thing going there. Uh, I did have a bit of a horror story, which I'll just touch on. And I'm, I'm a real optimist and I don't really dwell on horror stories, but I did have someone hack my Airbnb account and divert $32,000 of payments into an overseas bank account. Um, and my, my listings were shut down for a whole week and I didn't even know about it until several days into it when I noticed I wasn't getting inquiries. So um, fortunately, Airbnb made it right in terms of the money that had been diverted. 
I couldn't make up the lost revenue for a week not having any of my places advertised. But, uh, you know, I got through that one. And that was kind of my wake up call just four or five months ago, as far as not being totally dependent on one platform. Oh. Man, I didn't even know they could do that. Yeah. The <laughs> hackers are pretty smart these days, I tell you. <laughs> so how do you protect yourself from getting hacked again? Uh, you just have to have really good, unique passwords for all your accounts, change, uh -oh. them, you know, change them frequently. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was pretty complacent with, with passwords. Yeah. Use a couple of password, uh, password generators and uh, vault accounts. That's what I've been doing. So, yeah, do that often, especially if you have VAs. Um, so with, with the, that 85 to 90 percent, you said that that's that's a huge number right there. Um, when Airbnb announced, hey, that we're going to be refunding everyone. How did that did that have an impact on your calendar? And what yeah, that had a big impact. Uh, I mean, I, I knew we had to do something anyway, and I was, you know, figuring out how I could loosen my own cancellation policy on Airbnb, and then they unilaterally allowed guests to cancel all their bookings that had been made, you know, uh, between a certain range of dates. And so, yeah, immediately I, I was getting a lot of cancellations, and uh, my bookings kind of dropped off a cliff. Um, but that wasn't necessarily Airbnb's fault. I mean, they made it easier for people to cancel, but the alternative would have been people wouldn't have been able to travel and I'd be keeping a big chunk of their money, which I don't really feel good about anyway. I mean, I, I know a lot of friends of mine who are Airbnb hosts. They're like, I just take advantage of the cancellation policy. If they can't make it and they tell me, you know, 20 days before they're coming, I'm keeping that first month. And I'm like, nah, I mean, so, you know, I was all, I was already kind of client friendly in my approach to running my units, but, um, and but that kind of just took it out of my hands and Airbnb is like, we're going to be, we're going to go a hundred percent on the customer side on the, the, you know, the, the guest side and, uh, and give carte blanche refunds. So that was, that was really tough. And the refunds that Airbnb is now, issuing to hosts in as compensation that'll cover a fraction you know like maybe one eighth of what i would have made on the actual bookings um but you know it's uh it's better than nothing and i appreciate what they're doing in the in the crisis yeah it's something right throw uh throw us a bone or something yeah um, and, it, and it's it's going to be extremely expensive for them i mean they're spending you know 10 million dollars or something so it's not insignificant yeah, that's true. Um, what was I going to ask? So, so I guess you just started. You just started down that path of collecting them, and you got up to twenty five. I mean, wh was there a was there a particular reason you were trying to get so many? You just loved doing it, or what? What happened? You know, my my vision was to create a business doing furnished rentals that would restore my corporate income, basically, like. I mean, I didn't, I didn't necessarily need to be wealthy, but, uh, I, I wanted to be able to take vacations when I want to take vacations with my family, be able to pay for my daughter's education eventually, um, and also save for retirement. And it was really just being motivated to run a successful business that would help me to support my family. And, uh, and I, you know, and I, I, I am uh, a go-getter and, I thought if I could get up to 20, 30 units, then I would achieve that. Um, and 20, 2020 was going to be the year that like, I had this killer summer and I had all kinds of profit and I would, you know, wave the victory flag at the end of the year and that's not going to happen, but maybe 21, 2021 can be that way. So, you know. Yeah. As Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan so they get punched in the mouth, right? <laughs> That's it. I think, I think we're all. I think we're all taking uh, multiple punches to the face right now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough in a way because the city, because the cities over here in North Texas, were starting to shut down Airbnbs, mm -hmm. like completely shut down. No, no, you can't do it at your house or nothing like that. And so they, um, so I shut down. I have three rentals now. Now they're all long term. Mm -hmm. But then the coronavirus hit, and I'm like, well. You know, it's kind of bittersweet. It kind of like because now I just um, have my long-term tenants locked in, and they're paying, and it's fine. Yeah. 
and it could have been, you know, everything happens, you know, for a reason. But, but yeah, that's um, because I was, I was, I was dipping my toes into the into the arbitrage thing. I really wanted to do that, you know. Yeah. I just own my own units, and then, um, but we interview a lot of guys, like you said, Al Williamson, and um, we interview Jay Massey. He's a big, you know, over there in California. Yeah. And they do, um, yeah, they talk about arbitrage, this and that, and I was like, man, I got to get into it. And uh, I was trying. I almost, I almost locked in a lease right before this whole thing went down. I was like, "Oh shit, never mind." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, one thing I'm really getting into now, and this is, I think, a good tip for your listeners who are all focused on Airbnb and furnished rentals. If you're in an area, in like a metro area where there is normally a good amount of business travel, um, uh, or even people like remodeling homes that want to live somewhere for several months, you can still do rental arbitrage longer term and you can still make money at it, right? You rent out a place at or below market rent, furnish it nicely. And there's always a value to furniture, right? If someone can just step into your place, it's all nicely furnished and they don't have to move in. They can just keep working. And that's a a real money saver and a time saver for people. So what I'm looking at now and I'm kind of just transitioning a lot of my units over to long term is maybe making half the profits, but less than half the work is so that I'm not cranking out new guests every week or every month, get people in there for three months or six months or 12 months on a furnished rental contract. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's more like traditional property management. Uh, nice. So question for you, since, the coronavirus has hit you and you have 25 arbitrage units. How have you had to negotiate with any landlords about cheaper rent or anything like that? Or and yeah. if, so how does that, how has that worked for you? Yeah. I mean, this is where your relationships with your landlords are so important. Um, I've made calls to most of my landlords because um, many of the properties have short-term tenants leaving this month and next month and no one else coming in yet. And um, basically what I was telling landlords starting in mid March is, Hey, I'm going to pay April rent. Like that's no problem. Even if it's vacant all month, like I'll, I'll take that. I'm not going to leave you in the lurch, but going forward, you know, I may have to pull the lease effective May 1st or negotiate something with you where I'm not at risk for the full rent payment. So what I've been proposing to my landlords, and I'm still ironing out these agreements, is if I can't get their place booked for May onward, um, at least month to month, that I would do a revenue share, where it it would be more like a traditional property management agreement, where I'm taking 10% of the revenues just for managing and marketing and getting the tenants in there, um, and handling all the bills and so on, and they take 90%. And that way, if, if I can just book something starting mid-month in May, and then for a month, you know, say mid-May to mid-June, and nothing before and after, I'm paying, you know, giving them 90% of the revenue for that one-month booking. And, uh, and they understand. I mean, I'm mark- now I'm marketing the hell out of their properties with these long-term rental websites, short-term rental websites, And they know that if I can't rent, if I can't find tenants, they're not likely to be able to find tenants either. So they're pretty flexible. And, and, you know, because I have really good relationships with my landlords and most of my new units come through landlords referring other landlords to me, um, they're, they've been very understanding. They're like, we're going to get through this together. You know, it's a great relationship and, and uh, you know, we'll come out the other side. So um, I'm ironing those things out case by case um, based on the vacancies. See, I like that. Uh, I like that on two fronts because, first of all, I mean, it's kind of like the art of negotiation in a way. You always give them options, you know. Yeah. And you did that. You said, you know, I don't know what the other option was. I, 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 I can't pay it, or we, we, we'll, we'll do partners. I, I'll get the thing rented for you, and I take a chunk. Plus, the second thing is it takes the risk off of you by doing it that way. That's that's yeah. that's the biggest thing. You can sleep at night, you know, without yeah. having that looming um and whatever two thousand a month payment or what. I don't know how San Francisco's expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's but, cheap. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah, for a one bedroom, right? Uh, for um, but anyways, I think that's that's cool because yeah, no risk. Plus, you give them the options and you say, hey, we're partners in this. You're hurting, I'm hurting. Let's let's figure something out. That's that's yeah. how you do it. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll be honest. I kind of had my head in the sand for a little while in the beginning because I was like. 
oh, this thing is going to blow over. It's going to get better. I don't want to have these tough conversations. And eventually I just surrendered to it. And I'm like, I've got to communicate with these guys. They're my partners. You know, they're my lifeblood. And uh, if I if I have to give up units, I'm giving up future revenues. So I just started having the conversations and they were actually a lot easier uh, than expected. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm like, Steve, man, that's a great strategy. You're, you're showing the will to survive and how with that mentality that you have, that's how you're going to survive and make it through this. Mm-hmm. Um, so, cause you're saying, Hey, if they can't find people, if you can't find anyone, they can't find anyone. So is there a particular crowd that you're now targeting with everything going on? Yeah. Um, traveling medical professionals are still are traveling more than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, I've also considered contacting hospitals directly, both to access those traveling medical professionals, but also to offer up some of my units as recovery places for people that have the virus. You know, if if you've got a a four bedroom place, you know, the government will typically pay $50 per night for a hospital bed in, you know, various types of programs. So you've got four bedrooms and you're getting 200 bucks a night that'll cover costs and then some, I mean, that's like, that's like better than winter rates right there. So for larger places, especially uh, the numbers can work with, uh, with even government payments. So I'm trying to figure out how to access that. And then there's always people, families in my case, with my larger homes, three and four bedroom places that are looking for housing, you know, people that have just sold a house, they're going to buy a house. They've just moved to the area. There's something happening with their, work relocation and they just need to slide in somewhere for a few months and make it easy. And if, again, if you've got your, if you can rent a place fairly cheap and then you're offering it furnished for just like 10% more, 15% more, uh, it's really good value for people. So I've, I've just kind of fallen back on the housing fundamentals, you know, who needs long-term housing, who needs medium-term housing, really targeting the medium-term stuff to, traveling medical professionals and some construction workers are still working and then targeting longer term rentals to, you know, families and people who are just looking for a place to live for a while and, and prefer it furnished. Wow. So So, another question, because to go off that, because you were saying, Hey, you still have people coming in. You're, you're finding ways to find the people where are now, where are you getting most of your leads from at this point? Zillow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm still getting, I'm still getting Airbnb inquiries because I've dropped my Airbnb prices really low. And so if you search the peninsula in, you know, around SFO airport for like three bedroom, two bath houses, I've got some nice units out there and they're some of the cheapest on the market, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to plug, but I'm just saying like, if you've got the fundamentals right and you can drop your prices to a point where they're not that different than unfurnished homes, then you can keep them rented even through Airbnb. So it's not fail proof. I'm getting, uh, you know, a, a steady trickle of inquiries through Airbnb, a steady trickle of inquiries through Zillow. And just, and I've also got a, a newly hired virtual assistant in the Philippines who's marketing on uh, Facebook marketplace and Facebook housing groups, travel nursing groups, uh, Bay area housing groups, and just being really proactive in, in putting the listings out there. Now, I love that strategy because, I mean, like you said, it's compared to like renting out just against uh, versus another long-term rental that does that is not furnished. I mean, if you, as long as you could beat them out and getting a renter, even if you're making the same amount or just a little bit more, you're fine with that. And that, that automatically makes me think, what, 90% of the rentals out there are unfurnished. And right. so you're going to, just by having, throwing some furniture in there, I know it costs money or whatever, time. But just by doing that, I mean, that you're canceling out a big chunk of your competition. Yeah, that's true. If, if people want that and you have to kind of sell them on the value of having a furnished home. And so like I provide free internet, even though I've, I'm now, I'm now handing off the utility costs to the tenants, I'm still offering free high speed internet. Um, cause it's, it's just kind of a nice amenity. Um, And as far as like a tip for people that want to get into this business, this is a really good time to rent a place from a price perspective, because it's not just the hospitality and Airbnb industry that's suffering. 
it's also traditional landlords because people aren't moving a whole lot right now. And so I, I was out there on Craigslist the other day. I found like a really nice three bedroom, two bath property here in the Bay Area, not that far from the airport. It would normally be priced, I swear, at four grand a month. It was like 3000 a month. And I'm like, if I went out and rented that place today, it's, it's more exposure for me, but I could just rent it for 3000 this week and then re-rent it for, you know, 3800 next week without even throwing furniture in there. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a get rich quick scheme, but if you're committed to doing, uh, rental arbitrage, Airbnb or property management in some form, uh, you can pick up inventory right now. You can pick up units at really good rates because um, landlords are desperate to rent them out. And, uh, you know, you sign a one-year lease and get someone in there as quick as you can. You need to have good marketing on the front end. But then when the coronavirus lifts and you've got that one-year lease in place, you're going to have some nice margins coming in. So it's not for the faint-hearted. You know, you've got to be able to really get people in there once you rent the place out. But you can certainly negotiate couple weeks lead time to start furnishing the place or just start marketing it even if you're going to re-rent it unfurnished um you know it's just something to consider for folks who are entrepreneurial and wanting to find some uh, opportunities right now i guess that that makes me think because because i've been out you know like i said before this whole thing hit i was looking for arbitrage and then of course and a lot of people i was pitching it to i was doing my little sales pitch or whatever trying to tell them it's better to do it this way and i could rent it out you know um short term or, or corporate and um a lot of them they, they didn't know what that is and they didn't want to do it so okay they said no but now i, I mean I, after this whole thing hit i was like okay i backed off i'm not i hadn't been searching you know because of this the coronavirus and uh, a lot of those houses are still for rent. And I bet you if I went back to them, I said, hey, man, you know, I could rent it. I can get that <laughs> rented for you from you. And um, and they'd probably go for the deal now. Like you said, I mean, desperate times, you know, call for desperate measures. Right, right. And and the pitch is important. I mean, I think if we can just step back for a minute from coronavirus, because really that's my whole, all of our lives have just been changed incredibly. It's like, it's like the pre-apocalypse and post-apocalypse. And right now we're in the post-apocalypse and it's, it's bizarre. But um, if, you know, to just step back for a minute, like how do you approach a landlord to convince them to rent a property to you? And to me, it's really understanding what the landlord's pain points are and what an ideal tenant is for them. And most landlords hate doing property maintenance. They want to make sure the rent's paid on time every month. And they want to make sure that the place is kept in good condition. So when I pitch landlords, again, pre-apocalypse, and this is just to keep in mind, if and when you want to get into this, use Craigslist, find the good deals, look for the two unit places or the places you can carve up into a couple of units, go out, meet the landlord, and, you know, what I'll usually do is, like, look at the place, compliment it, uh, ask them some questions, like, where do you live? Did you used to live here? Um, are you actively managing the property yourself, or do you have a, a company that you use? Just try to get them talking about their experience as a landlord and what they're looking for in a tenant. And then they'll always ask, well, what's your situation? How many people in your family? And that's when I'll say, you know, I'm a little different than the typical tenant that's going to be looking at this place. I'd like to rent your property and use it as a corporate rental because I think it's a really nice place. And I think that business travelers would really appreciate being here. And um, so what I would do is rent it from you uh, on a one year lease, pay you the full rent that you're asking. I'd pay rent early every month through an auto payment. I'd also offer you free property maintenance so that, Anything that is going to cost $200 or two hours of my time or less, I'll just cover it whenever those things come up. And I'll, I'll just tell you about it afterwards, you know, just so you know that everything's being taken care of. And if there's anything major, I'll get bids for you from plumbers, electricians, or whatever, make a recommendation, and then I'll oversee the repair and just consult with you, make sure you're okay with who I'm recommending, and then send you the bill. Um, and they love that. Um, you know, and then I say in between 
corporate tenants, it, it's going to be cleaned professionally every time, and I'll get to inspect it, or at least my cleaner will inspect it, and we'll make sure that your property is kept in terrific shape because every new guest coming in, every new tenant coming in, it has to show really well because that's what they expect. Uh, and then the last thing I'll usually say is many of these people, their companies are paying for their housing, which is true. And um, it's in their best interest to take really good care of the place because they want to stay in good standing with their employer. You know, and they're hard workers. They work 10 hours a day. They just want to you know, kind of crash at night and relax, make something quick to eat. They're not partiers. And it's really kind of a, unless you just have a bad feeling about furnished rentals, short-term rentals, Airbnb, multiple tenants living in your house over the course of a year, unless you have a real like aversion to that, most landlords really are intrigued by that. And um, I, I've probably got maybe a 30, 30 to 40% close rate when I actually go and meet with landlords in person. And some people just send out a bunch of emails. Some people make cold calls and they find that more efficient because it takes time to meet with landlords. You'll just have a much lower close rate if you do that. And I like to go and look at the property, determine, is this really a place that I want and what's it worth for me? And then, and then have the conversation with the landlord. And I, I think that's really important. Just, I, I didn't mean to spend so much time, but I think that that script is really helpful for people. I think that's very, very helpful, especially in a time like now, you know, when people who are scared to hop in and don't realize, hey, they can still go out there and do it. Even the people that are looking to bring on more units, you know, I think they could still do it because it's a lot of people throwing in the towel, you know. Yeah. That's, that, that's where the opportunity is going to come in for the new entrepreneur, you know. Yeah. Uh, so with this whole coronavirus thing, and like you said, I think a lot of traveling nurses are traveling right now. What do you think the, when do you think this will end? And what do you think the effect will be after all this is done? Oh boy, I'm I'm not a great uh, you know uh, fortune teller, but <laughs> I based on what I've heard and read, uh, I think probably I'm anticipating that the summer, which is usually haymaking season, just about anywhere if you're running a short term rental, I I'm just assuming that's going to be like the winter, and that. It at best, at best, like to me, that's kind of trying to be cautious. I think best case scenario, like summer is still going to be like winter, meaning I'll be getting bookings, whether it's medium term, short term, long term, but at much lower rates than what I'm typically used to during the summer, more like winter rates. And I'm hopeful that by fall, let's say six months from now, you know, September, October, that, um, the curve will have flattened that the new cases will be going down and that um, there's going to be a pent up demand for travel. I mean, I know there will be, it's just a question of when, and then people start traveling again and, um, and things return to somewhat more normal. Uh, but as far as the fallout, I think you're right, Micah, a lot of short term rental operators are getting out of this business and um, either getting out or, you know, doing what I'm doing, which is tying up a lot of short-term rentals into medium and long-term contracts to remove the risk. And so I think initially for the short-term rental operators that are still in business, when we get that early surge in travel, I think there's going to be a real profit opportunity for people that are still running the units because supply is going to be so down. And even though the barriers to entry to like set up an Airbnb and launch and get going are not that high, it still makes a big difference. If you've been in business consistently, you've got those five star ratings, you're a super host on Airbnb, you've got a lot of recent reviews then people are going to want to book with you. So I do think if this is an opportunity for businesses like mine to um, hire virtual assistants, really pump up your marketing efforts, start advertising on a bunch of different websites, shift some of your rentals long-term, get your books in order. My books have not been in order and now I'm getting them in order. And, you know, just kind of strengthen the fundamentals that you're, you need for a business like this to run it efficiently and to scale it. And then those that are left standing six months from now are going to be the victors who can then really, you know, profit into the future. 
Now, something that just crossed my mind when you were saying that uh, the summer could be the could be like winter because things are kind of gradually getting back to normal. I see. And you said that people are going to be itching to travel. I think I think the group that's going to be itching to travel the most is these are these young, the young generation, the young live my best life generation who yeah. see all these plane tickets for cheap. And all these Airbnbs, you know, discounted prices, they're like, ah, I can finally go to San Fran. I can finally go to New York. I can finally go to Europe, you know? Yeah. It's just like, uh, I think they're going to be hitting it hard, getting all these discounted airfares and, and just want to go see the whole world, man. I think you're right. I think you're totally right. I mean, I, uh, this is a quick little side story, but my family and I were going to go to the East Coast for spring break because I, I grew up in Boston. My family's never been to New York, and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. And then, of course, this whole thing exploded, and we couldn't go anywhere. But uh, I was looking on Airbnb because I'm like, Airbnbs are so cheap right now. Like, like our house is no less safe than some other house that's twice as nice, like an hour away. So we're looking on Airbnb, and I find this villa in Marin, like right on the bay. This place has a swimming pool, a hot tub, and like a little dock out the back with this canal and like a couple of kayaks. And, and then you could like kayak down the canal and into this lagoon and look, check out all these $5 million houses. I mean, it was crazy. So we rented this place for like 180 bucks a night. It's like the price of a nice hotel room. It's 2,200 square feet. And I'm there with my family and my niece. And we're just like playing board games and enjoying the sunshine and, you know, playing croquet. And so, I, I mean, I'm just saying, like, for those who are willing to travel right now and travel safely and jump in your car and drive somewhere 30 minutes, an hour, two hours away, you can sometimes find some really great last minute deals. So just a tip for people who don't mind venturing out past their zip code right now. <laughs> That's awesome. It's funny you say that. I said, um, OK, because the markets that I didn't take a hit on are the markets that people drive to instead of fly to. Yeah. That's a good point. People will still hop in a car and go take a quick vacation, you know? So it's, 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 uh, people are still traveling at this time. Uh, the reason I asked about the travel thing is because me and Steve were talking the other day and I think Steve just answered the question. We were like, I think the media has created such a scare around travel. I wonder if travel is going to bounce back as soon as we get the, Hey, it's all clear. I think Steve's right. You know, I didn't think about the millennials. That that might be, or the Gen Z. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, that might be it. That's it. That's it. And he, he, even the old folks like me are going to be traveling, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Living your best life. That's it. That's um, it. Going back to real quick, the the whole um, talking to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the landlords, because I, that's one thing I was trying to do. I was try, I always send out my email on Zillow. You know, I would send out, my little spiel. It started out this long. I got it. I got it. Just like, man, they're not responding. I got it down to about this long and started getting more responses. Right. Good. And um, I was explaining a lot of things that you had said and, um, you know, and the cool and the cool little um, trick that, that, that um, Mike had taught me in doing my pitch was that tell them that you'll do the repairs, you know, $200 or less. And, I, and he said, but then, you know, if something does get broke, you can just hit up Airbnb, say they broke it and then Airbnb will pay for that repair. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool little, right, little caveat right, right there. But um, I never did um, a face-to-face -face with any of them. I never did a face-to-face. -face. But a lot of them, so here's, the, here's the problem. A lot of them here in this area, in North, in North Texas, they use, a, they use a, a, what's it called? A, someone property told, manager. Property manager. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I would see the property manager and I'd explain it to them and say, oh, okay, I'll, let, me, let me run it by my client you know, and see what they say. And that's what that's what was tripping me up. I never got to to meet directly with the with the one on one yeah. with the, the landlord. You know what I'm saying? I think you'll find that a lot with larger buildings. You know, big multi unit buildings. They've almost always got a property manager, and the property manager doesn't quite get what you're doing, and they might perceive it as competition. And um, so I think right now my strategy that's worked for me and everyone, I know friends who, who have lots of apartments in multi-unit buildings, but my strategy is to go for single family homes, little two and three unit homes. I've only got a couple of apartments. Um, uh, and I do think though in the current environment, 
vacancy is vacancy, right? And if you, if a property manager is posting several units for rent in one building, chances are they're going to be a lot more willing to talk to you than they would have been three months ago. So uh, yeah, I, I generally steer clear of property managers because I just have not had luck with them. I've had way more luck with, with the actual landlords. So you have to understand your market. You can also network with realtors, you know, cause they know who the landlords are, who the property managers are. And, um, and they can sometimes connect you to someone. And if you go to uh, virtual meetups with property managers, virtual meetups with realtors, uh, you can sometimes get referrals that way. Uh, every market's going to be different, but obviously if you can talk directly to the landlord, the homeowner, that's the best way to go. If you check Craigslist, you can often tell by the listings if it's put up by a professional property manager, because it'll say managed by such and such properties, it'll have a really nice organized description, sounds like something out of good housekeeping. You, you look at something that a landlord puts up and it's just kind of mom and pop, you know, and, and it's like contact Joe. And so, and Craigslist also has lower rents than something like a Zillow, um, even for the same product, because it's, it's like, Craigslist is like the every man's, the every person's listing forum, you know, where Zillow is more polished and it's more like for real estate professionals. I mean, anyone can use it, but it really started, was started by real estate professionals and Craigslist is just like, it's like, you know, the virtual yard sale. So you can also get the best rents through Craigslist. That's, that's, that's a great point right there. And, um, when you said that about, you know, Joe Schmo putting up, uh, Hey, uh, my house is for rent. Call me, you know, kind of that's, that's, yeah. I never thought of that until I, I, I thought about stuff like that one, like looking for my next, you know, house to purchase to be a rental because I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll open up a, a Zillow and I'll see, Oh, okay. You know, professional pictures, crap. They're going to want a lot of money for this in a stage and everything. Ah, they're going to want top dollar for this house. Yeah. And then, uh, then I see one where Joe Schmo gets his cell, his camera, his, his phone and starts taking snaps and toilet seats up and all. I was like, oh man, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get a good deal on this house. That's the it one all, I want to go talk to. It's all, it's all dark. You're like, is that yeah. the, the living room or the bedroom? You know, like the pic. Oh, that's great. That's great. When you find a place that just got terrible marketing, you're like, I'm going to rent that place up because I bet it looks a whole lot better in real life <laughs> at least open the curtains right when you take the yeah, pictures jeez that's it but that's that's some brilliant advice right there so look for bad bad listings and then you can yeah. get a great deal that way that's awesome it's just like the flipping it's kind of like the flipping philosophy right you look for the places that don't show well i mean i've i've put i put like an extra few thousand dollars into an apartment that was in really bad shape because the landlord gave me such a good deal on rent that I was like, I'm just going to paint this place from top to bottom. I'm going to fix the closet doors and put in new hardware and new light fixtures and make it look like a nice rental. And so I got it for dirt cheap in terms of my rental rate, put in another couple thousand dollars. And over the course of the year, I made it back, right? And I'm still, I'm still managing the place. So I do kind of, I do have that fixer mentality when it comes to rental properties. Now, some of the places I've rented, are beautiful, turnkey, move-in ready, remodeled, but I don't mind the ugly places as long as the rooms are big and I can paint them and clean them up and make them look nice. See, that's what I was going to ask you too, because there was this um, this house I was looking at and before this whole thing hit, and I was, I mean, it needed some paint. I mean, they did a paint job that was terrible. I mean, the walls were the same color as the ceiling. It was just, it was a mess. And I was... Um, I was wondering if like, man, I mean, they even said I can get a discount if I wanted to do some touching up. And I was like, man, I never, this is my first arbitrage. I don't know. Should I do that? Should I go in there and paint the, paint the rooms and paint the house? And, and oh, now yeah. that, that you said that, I was like, man, that, I sh that's a good deal. I mean, if I can get a hundred dollars off a month on the rent or more, if yeah. I just have to paint the walls, I mean, that's a damn good deal. That's right. That's right. Paint is cheap and late, you know, painting labor is fairly cheap too. Like paint is the, uh, Paint is probably a, the best investment you can make in a place. I mean, it's just so simple and it makes a big difference. Sweet. Now, what about appliances? Do they usually leave appliances for you? Uh, usually, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll invest in nice mini appliances, you know, so my places have the little like stainless microwave and like a stainless toaster oven and a Keurig coffee maker and 
really nice fluffy spa towels and I mean all that stuff is just a tiny bit more than the cheap stuff so when it comes to what I call like mini amenities I make I invest in you know brand name stuff stainless stuff and um, and that way you can advertise that in your listing you know like ooh they're 10 inch thick memory foam mattresses. Well, yeah, it was only 200 bucks. You know, it's not like, you can still make it sound like a luxury hotel, even if you're not spending that much. So, yeah. That is awesome. We, we interviewed a guy one time who he knows, he does, he knows, he's a contractor, but he, you know, he sets up his own Airbnbs. And one thing that he, that set his place off, he knew how to put that, the waterfall um, shower head. He knew how to install that himself. Oh, yeah. But most people are like, holy crap, that's like a rich people thing, you know? Yeah, right. But he, but he said, no, it's easy. You just go, he goes, a regular person, it might be a little, a lot of work. But for me, I just go through the ceiling, stick it yeah. there, boom, 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 a few pipes, and it's just like this this waterfall. And people, I mean, it just sets yeah. off this place. So, I mean, yeah, these little things that don't cost a lot of money, really, I mean, they can make you some big money. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So then my next question for you is, because you were saying about picking up units, do, do you plan on picking up units during this time or are you kind of being conservative? I'm being conservative. And the reason for that is that I've got like over the next month or so, I need to fill half my units, you know, because I've got a lot of them that are coming vacant uh, now or two weeks from now or a month from now. If I had already figured out my marketing and I was ahead of that and I was kind of getting, if I let, let's say three months from now, if I've got 90% of my places booked on medium and long-term contracts, then I will seriously consider picking up extra units. It's just that I and many others like me were not prepared for this. And if you're running on short-term bookings and they're coming in, you know, every, every week, and then they just suddenly stop, then pretty soon, you know, the vacancies start expanding each week on your calendar. And so, yeah, I'm in, in a position now where I'm just trying to make that shift to, uh, to longer term rentals. And then when I stabilize, I'll definitely look around like what's available now and can I get stuff for cheap? And um, cause the, if the fundamentals are there, if I can pick up the, one of these nice two unit houses here in the Bay area for like four, $4,500. And I know that I could turn around and rent an unfurnished for 5,500 and furnished for 6,500, you know, like that's kind of a no brainer. It's just, uh, it's just a question of timing and like having my own house in order to be able to do that. Man. I mean, even if you could just guarantee that you, you're going to break, uh, break even throughout this time period, yeah. and then you'll lock in and then get past all this. Ooh, you'll be sitting pretty. That's my goal, really, is just to break even. And I'll, I just want to expand the conversation for a minute and talk about uh, assistance right now, right? So I'm, I'm a little late to the game as far, and, and you know, I don't know exactly when this uh, podcast is going to air, but I've just shifted my whole philosophy from like, I don't need any handouts, I've got this covered, I'm going to manage through it, to like, take advantage of what's, whatever's out there. If you can push back your primary mortgage on forbearance for three months, do it. And generally you can, I, I haven't heard any banks pushing back on that. If you've got investment properties and your income is affected and you can push back your, uh, you know, your mortgage on those for three months, do it. If you can get the PPP loan cause you have employees and you know, you get the grant for that, do it. The dessert, you know, emergency relief loan. So I'm, I've just in the last week, um, it's now what early April, I've just in the last week kind of shifted my thinking around um, how aggressively to go after those things. And, and right now I'm feeling good about it. Also pursuing a home equity line of credit, basically just trying to create as much capital as I can so I can hang on to my business. And not only that, but be prepared to both invest in new rental units, but also make a, a, a buy something, right? A, like a, a real estate investment um, coming out of this thing. That's, that's interesting. Um, that's, that's a great way to look at it because, and another thing I was thinking too was, uh, you know, trying to get the best deal right now and, and being able to rent a spot at a great price, but even, I know you've probably thought of it already too, cause you think of everything, but, <laughs> but even trying to even talk to him, Hey, listen, it's a little rough right now with everything going on, but I'll, I'll rent your place for a year, but can you give me a break on the first month? 
like sure. two months. Are you are you throwing that out there or what's going on? You know, if I were looking for u- new units, I absolutely would. And I mean, one thing that I've always done is, hey, listen, I'm willing to, you know, sign this contract with you right now on the lease and then you don't have to worry about finding a tenant anymore i'll give you first month's rent deposit and so on but i want to start the actual rent i want the rent payment to be effective two three weeks from now and in the meantime i need that time to furnish the place because i can't i can't launch this unit losing losing revenues for two weeks while i'm furnishing it and it would take you a two or three weeks to get someone in here anyway. So, you know, and, and they generally say yes. And they're, as long as I've signed the lease and I'm legally liable for the property effective today, most landlords have no problem saying, yeah, sure. Um, you can move in today, April 7th or whatever, but the first rent payment you're making is for May 1st for the month of May. And, 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 and I'm not using the place. I'm also very clear, like, I'm not going to be living here. I'm not asking for free housing. I just need to, like, move in the furniture. And this is a business for me. So give me two weeks to do that. And then we'll have the rent be effective two weeks from now. Even though hopefully you, you'll knock it all out in one or two days, right? Well, well <laughs> you know, I, I am not that efficient, I'll tell you. I, I, <laughs> I, I run around with my minivan. And there are certain things. I am cheap, I'm telling you. I pick up certain things on Craigslist. Like I'll go get nice dressers, um, uh, sofa beds, dining sets, because they don't necessarily need to match everything. You know, like I always order all my beds on Amazon. I order all my end tables on Amazon. But when it comes to like a dining set, you only need one, right? And it comes to like a sofa bed. You always want to put sofa beds in your places because more beds, more heads. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, so sofa beds, dining sets, they're expensive. If you buy good quality stuff, you can get it for half price if you buy it used. And if you have a minivan, you have some time, you need to get it yourself or pay someone to get it for you, and you'll you'll still end up getting a much better deal in terms of time and money than you would if you buy something cheap from, you know, brand new. That's a good point. That's a good point. So, yeah, a little bit frugal, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you got to be. I'm telling you, you got to be scrappy. Like, I've never ever targeted the high end and um, as much as possible when it comes to investment properties, when it comes to, I mean, buying in the Bay Area by definition is high end, but I've always bought fixer properties, right? And I've always bought places that had kind of a bunch of bedrooms, but small properties because by the bedroom, right, the price is cheaper. And it's like that with my rental properties too. I don't have any huge two bedroom houses. I've got compact three bedroom houses, compact four bedroom houses, little studios. I don't even have any one bedrooms because to me, like most people don't differentiate that much between a one bedroom and a studio and studios are a lot cheaper for me. So um, I'm, I'm learning more than ever in this COVID crisis that if you invest for recession proof things like affordable housing, uh, whether it's Uh, a purchase or a rental where you're trying to turn around affordable housing and offer it to someone else furnished, um, you're in much better shape than if you're in the luxury market or in like the tourist only market where you're really kind of screwed uh, when something like this happens. Now here's, here's a question because, because now I know the Bay area, uh, you know, real estate's really high. So they build, they build up, right? They build up because it's, yeah. it's, uh, the land is so expensive. Yeah. Um, so, and most of those places have, what, three flights? Three flights of stairs? or maybe uh, Well, the houses, a lot of houses are two-story. There's still a bunch of one-story houses. So, okay. yeah, I mean, you're, you're thinking probably of like kind of the traditional Victorian in the city, and some of those are a full three stories. Um, my homes tend to be in slightly more suburban areas. Like, okay. You know, within 10 miles of the airport, a few in San Francisco, but even my San Francisco places, none of them bigger than a couple of stories. Because uh, what I was getting at is, um, is finding furniture cheap. I know someone like on the third story, they, they're going to want to get rid of that crap. Come pick it up kind of thing, right? You got to take it down three, st- three, <laughs> three flights yeah. by yourself kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, yeah, you can pick up a lot of good stuff on Craigslist if you have the time, right? It's always a time... Versus money trade-off. And I, I spent 
I've spent a couple of years in this business doing 90% of it myself. I mean, all that I was outsourcing was cleaning and then I would get help and outsource maybe 70% of the setup when it came to moving furniture. I would get helpers when it came to assembling furniture. I would use get friends. And, and now I'm finally at that point where I'm really wanting to scale the business and automate the business. And so I've got a, uh, a virtual assistant in the Philippines and I've got a really sharp marketing guy in the Philippines who, who does awesome online marketing for like six bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've just tried to get a little bit smarter and let go a little more and focus on the stuff I need to do to build capital right now so that other people can market my business and, and increasingly run it a little bit for me. Awesome, man. That's because I'm huge on automations. I love it. So has, has bedroom rentals been effective during the COVID-19 or have you transitioned to it? You know, I haven't, I've, um, I haven't, I tried it once early on and it wasn't successful for me. It may have just been the, the season. Um, it may have been the unit. Um, it is effective though. I know people and I've seen units recently, including a couple that I was potentially going to take over and manage for the owner. So I've seen kind of dormitory style, you know, co-living places where each room has its own separate smart lock and there's, and some of the rooms have their own private bathroom. And then there's a common space with like a living area and a kitchen. And those can actually be very profitable. I mean, if you just, again, if you take the numbers here in the Bay area and just knock off a zero in some other places, you know, and you're, and you can rent out an individual bedroom in like a co-living situation for 1200 bucks, 1300 bucks, that's probably 10% more than if you were to rent out the whole house as a four or five bedroom place. Now that works when you have compact places with lots of bedrooms in them, right? If you've got a huge common area or really big bedrooms or whatever, it's just not going to work unless you put a bunch of beds in the bedrooms, right? But, and that gets a little crazy as far as the number of in inhabitants. But if you've got a kind of a compact four or five bedroom place and you're willing to manage the different tenants, right? It's more work if you're managing multiple tenants under one roof, but you can definitely make, you know, uh, 15, 20% more than if you're renting or, or more, maybe 40% more depending on the building and, and the market than if you're renting it out as a single unit. But I've always, I've personally, I've just always had more success renting out whole units and, um, and I've still been able to make money that way. And I've just, only had to deal with one tenant per property. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's just, I was like, especially the, since it's, I guess the Bay Area, it has a lot of travelers, business travelers, things like that. So I guess you probably don't even have to really worry about that. That, that, that That's a blessing. It is. It is, yes. Man, that's... Oh, hey, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. What's cool about how you were... Um how you're, you're doing all this and, and even the, you know, handling, like you said, 90% of it yourself, even if you do move away from, you know, you put it into more into automation or whatever. And, and it's, 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 it's great that you know how to do all this stuff, how you, how to set it up yourself, how to find the stuff, how to put it together. You're not just saying, Oh, let me get uh let me see. Let me get someone that does that, that puts the like, interior decorator, let them do it here. Here's five grand, 10 grand, do it. And this and that. And, um, but what's cool about it is that when it does get into a crunch like this, like when the coronavirus hits and this, you have to find ways to cut corners. And if you did automate it, like you learned to automate hundred percent, you, you can, you have something to fall back on. You say, well, shit, I'm not going to pay yeah. someone 10 grand to decorate a place more. I'll do that. I'm, I'm not going to pay someone to, to fix sinks or a toilet anymore. I guess I got to get on my knees and do that. And, uh, and then you, there's ways to save money. And then even, I mean, you could even clean a unit if need be, you know, there's, there's ways yeah. to catch some of that money that's always been going out because we've been making like five grand a month on a spot easy then all of a sudden it tightens up. You're like, crap, I got to yeah. cut corners. And you know how to do all this stuff already. Yeah, it, it, it definitely um, pays. If you're going to start a business, it pays to know how to do most of it yourself so that when you outsource it, you know how to do it right. And you know how much time it takes and you know the value of the work and you appreciate the people who are doing it. 
but they're also not going to overcharge you, right? And you can kind of oversee the work um, just to make sure you can hand it off uh, successfully and really be able to trust the people who are doing it for you. So I'm a huge believer in understanding all the aspects of your business as you build it so that you can then hand it off and, and trust the processes and know how it's done right and then let someone else take it to a whole new level that you never did because that's maybe not your expertise. Um, I mean, the one thing I don't really care to learn and I'm in trouble is accounting. You know, I got to just like get that off my plate. I, I was cheap in that front and that's really not smart. Like if you don't know how to do something and you're not willing to do it, you can't be cheap about it because you got to be able to act. You, you actually have to do something if you want to be cheap about it. But if you're ignoring it and blowing it off, then like you, you have to pay someone else. So I'm, you know, I'm uh, hiring a few professionals in different arenas right now, including a very, expensive accountant but it's going to be well worth it in the end yeah it'll pay for itself i'm sure amen yeah if you can go from active passive income to active income you can always stay afloat that's a quote i heard the other day uh because like you said if you have to and i think we've said it before on this podcast before you automate something or outsource it you should know how to do it one so you can train someone efficiently efficiently and effectively on it and then times like this, like Steve said, you can go clean a unit, do all that, and bring that money back in. So, yeah, it, it's – That's it. You me. know, yeah, uh, rental arbitrage is really nothing more than, like, glorified property management. But I'll tell you, like, I'll tell you the thing I love about property management is you can add a ton of value to the property. You know, like, as a property buyer, I have – in my life bought a total of like four homes. And in each case, I was able to buy something that was not in good shape and improve it. Not, not necessarily do the work myself, but have it improved and renovated and add a ton of value to it. And then I just applied that same thinking to the rental arbitrage business where you rent an unfurnished place. It might even need work in terms of the paint and the light fixtures and the smart locks, the stuff I mentioned earlier, but then you, you either put the work in yourself or get it done and, and pay for it. And then you've added value to it and you add the furniture and that adds value to it. And so the reason I've, I've always liked real estate more than like the stock market is it's a tangible asset and I can, I can directly add value myself. And I can oversee that with a company. I just have to make sure that I'm picking a company that's really well run. And then, then I kind of watch it from afar. I, I, don't, I don't really care for passive investing. I know that's kind of sacrilege, right, in the world of, of real estate because that's, like <laughs> that's like the holy grail. Like most people want to just sit back and press a few keyboard strokes every day and just watch their millions grow in the bank. That would bore the heck out of me. I like to, you know, I like to get in there and manage the, the hell out of something and, and add the value and, and base my, you know, see my, my fortune grow from there. So, you know, different, it's a different philosophy, you know, not, you know, some people like to be active and others don't. I actually like, I actually like that concept because I, I, I don't touch stocks. I do a little bit, but I don't touch stocks because of that reason. I think it's because I guess it's like how you say, I think it's just a lack of control. Yeah, like, like you said, I can add the value there. You're invested, but you have no control, and that's my thing. I, I'm, yeah. I'm 100 with you on that. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Control freaks unite. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So you're not returning back to corporate America, right? No, I'm not. I'm not. I uh, I don't think I'll ever go back. So you know, I'm gonna have to. I'm going to have to be successful in real estate one way or another, or you're going to, you're going to find me on the street in no time. <laughs> so you consider yourself financially independent? Um, you know, I'm getting there. I, um, I still have to work, but I do have a lot of flexibility in how I work and when I work. Um, I mean, certainly right now, I don't feel financially dependent at all, financially independent at all, because I'm putting so much work into stabilizing my business, but I could see how, you know, a year from now, if I've got a bunch of my units into long-term rentals and I'm doing more of a traditional property management role, and I've still got some really good units on running on short-term rentals that I could get to a place where 
I'm, uh, let's just say financially flexible. Um, and, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be a while. And again, I like to manage things. So financial independence to me is like, you don't really have to work. And I, I do need to work to keep my business going. Um, but I, I'd like to be in a place a year, two, three years from now where my business is strong enough, the systems are strong enough, it's automated enough that I can step away as much as I want to. And, and, and this COVID thing has really kicked my ass to, to do the automation, to find the marketing experts, to uh, get the books, get the QuickBooks running really, really well. You hand that off to an expert. And I think uh, it's kind of a blessing in disguise just as far as um, building the business. It's, it's obviously tragic what it's doing to public health and people's lives and the economy as a whole. But um, I do feel like it's forcing entrepreneurs who have been affected by this to really pivot and shift and kind of reinvent themselves. So that, you know, for those of us that are still at it when, you know, on the other end, uh, I think we're going to be a lot stronger. Yeah. I think it's really going to separate the contenders from the pretenders, right? Yeah. Uh, And so, I mean, if you, if we just hang in there, you know, our audience included, just hang in there through this and just find a way, you know, to scrape and fight and, and, and just, just find a way to get to the other side. I mean, there's a lot of people that are going to be sitting pretty because so many people are just going to drop out and give up. That's it. That's it. Yeah. See, and I think, I think there's an opportunity to take over those leases for the people that are dropping out. You know, that's, yeah. an opportunity. that's a huge opportunity. You know? You're right. I mean, for anyone that has, some capital and wants to get into rental arbitrage, Airbnb management, look around in your local market. I'm sure there are people just like me and you that that are saying, I've had enough of this. I don't want to, I don't want to manage long-term properties. You know, I, I, it's too much work. It's too uncertain. I want to just have someone buy the furniture and take over the lease and, you know, I'll, I'll cut my losses and, you know, sell it for what's what I paid for it and not, and then there's no premium on the, you know, the labor and the time that someone's put into building up a five-star property or whatever. So yeah, I think from a business acquisition standpoint, you can definitely take over businesses like this. Now, if you're, if you've got the grit and the marketing savvy to, um, to, to fill the vacancy. Now, You've 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 been so hands on in your business, and um, so obviously you, you've discovered a few uh, workarounds or shortcuts or, or little hacks, you know. And I always like to ask a guest, and I know you've given us so much, you know, so much great information today already. But is there like a an Ethan Cook hack, like when doing um, short term or corporate or something like that? Something that pops out that you like figured out. You're like, whoa, that's kind of cool, you know? Yeah, yeah. The, the the best one, hands down, is this multi unit strategy. I'm telling you, if you can find a single family home that someone is marketing, or let's say a a, a couple of units in one, like a single family home with an in law, and someone's basically marketing it as a single family home on Craigslist, you can, that's where your, your profits coming in. Right. And, and just as like a simple, if you want it, like a real tactical hack here, go on Craigslist, do a search for homes with at least four bedrooms, three bathrooms in your area, and then look at the pictures, read the listing and figure out, is there like a, like an, a second master suite or is there a uh you know a downstairs unit or an in-law unit or something you know an au pair unit there's they call them different things but a lot of older homes especially here in the bay area and i'm sure this is true in a lot of areas they are set up that way there is a second unit either carved out already or something you can carve out yourself because guess what? There's a sliding glass door that comes into this master bedroom and you can just close the door and throw in a wet bar for 1500 bucks. And you've got a kitchenette and a bathroom and a bedroom all in one. You've got your own little studio unit. And you know, and most landlords, if you say, I'd like to add a wet bar, it's, you know, some people will negotiate that. They're like, and you're like long-term, you can rent it out as two units. It's going to add value to your property. It's going to boost your rental income. 
And you might not do it in year one. You might rent a property and run it as a full property. I have landlords now, they're like, oh yeah, you want to block off that wall, add a door there and, and add a, uh, add an, a, a, you know, a, a, a little, a sink in that room. Like, that's cool. Yeah, go ahead. You pay for it. And I, I trust you. <laughs> so um, if you can just carve out those two units in one and find properties that lend themselves to that, because just think about the math and I'll, I'll just take kind of a more of an average math uh, rather than focusing on Bay area. But let's say you can find a, single family home in your metro for 2000 a month, right? Three bedroom, two bath. And you find one that's got this little in-law unit. And let's say that that $2,000 place, you could also rent out a studio in your market for a thousand a month, right? So now you've just found a place for 2000, but the value for you in the three units unfurnished is 3000. And now you add the furniture and you rent out the studio for 1500 a month and the single family for 2800 a month. And now you're making 4300 on these two units that you're paying 2000 for. And I mean, and maybe that's generous. Maybe it's only 33, 3500 and maybe your costs are 2500 because you've got utilities and you've got internet, but you're still making a thousand bucks a month on this one home. So, and maybe it's only 500, but that's great, right? You, you rent, you're paying one rent check, it's 2,000 bucks, you're paying 500 bucks for utilities, and you're still clearing 500 bucks a month for a single property. Like, it's not bad, and, and you probably have to spend 2,000 on rent, first month's rent, 2,000 on the deposit, that's four grand, and then maybe another five grand to furnish the place. So you spent nine grand, but that extra five grand, you're going to make it back in, in 10 months. In right? 10 months, you're going to make back 500 bucks a month, and that's conservative. And then after that, that 500 bucks a month is profit. Um, now, your, your time is worth something, so hopefully you can find medium or long-term renters to get in there so you're not having to turn it every month um, and deal with vacancy during this really uncertain time. But, you know, there, there are, that's the best way I've found and the easiest way in my market to make money uh, doing rental arbitrage. That's great advice, man. That's great advice. And another thing that I, that I got from all that is I'm about to start hitting up Craigslist like it's 2005 again. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I'm telling you, Craigslist, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because it's like full of scammers. It's full of bottom feeders. Like people are going to contact you and be like, Oh, will you take half the rent that you posted? Cause you know, I'm a nice person and I'm broke. And you know, like <laughs> the reality is, but the reality is like you can find really good deals on Craigslist and imagine as a, as a renter or a buyer of used furniture, whatever you're using Craigslist for, if you can present yourself as credible and professional and you know, high integrity and like you're going to pay the rent and you're going to manage the property really professionally, like, you're going to totally stand out from 80% of the people who are contacting that person about their home or at least 50%, right? Because it really is like, it's just a, such a spectrum of people that use Craigslist. And so if you can stand out as like this really professional person who's contacting them, you know, you're going to like make their day because they don't want to deal with all the, you know, all the, the, the like the, the scams and the, the, the low ballers either. So there you go. Hit up the CL, Micah. <laughs> I, I, might, I might start hitting up Craigslist. I'm definitely, I definitely post on there. So I, 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 hit up. I definitely post my properties on there. But I'm definitely hitting up Rent Links and Turbo Tenant. I'm yeah. like, just to get on that now, I'm like, whoa, okay. Because I'm, I'm all about automation. So if it makes it easier where I can just go to one-stop shop, they do it for me, I'm good. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can get all your listings out to all those long-term rental websites. And depending on what you want from the platform, they can do, you know, background checks. They can, you can collect your rent through the platform. Um, so you can, you can kind of automate a lot of your operations on there too. That is definitely what I need. Wow. Well, Ethan, thank you so much for hopping on with us. It's been a pleasure. You've been dropping so many gold nuggets left and right, man. It's been insane. Um, where can folks find you? Uh, folks can find me for sure on Facebook. Uh, if you just look me up on Ethan Cook, you can find me on LinkedIn. If you just uh, type in Ethan Cook, 
HR consultant. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say I don't have an Instagram account, but you know, I'm, I'm, it's just like one generation behind me. So, <laughs> but yeah, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can Google me. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm the only uh, Ethan Cook with an E on the end in San Francisco HR consultant, and you'll you'll find me. I thought you were going to say I'm embarrassed to say, but you can find me on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can yeah, you can find my properties. Oh, and my company website, which I'm still building out, is BayPillow.com. It's one word, BayPillow.com. So you can contact me through there too. BayPillow.com. You got it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for hopping on. Micah, got any more questions? No, man. I, I learned a wealth of knowledge. I've been over here typing up notes left and right of everything you've been saying. Uh, I would like to say thank you for coming on and thank you for short, li- having our listeners realize that you can still push through this. Uh, just You can always push through adversity. Uh, it just takes commitment and you just have a, have a mindset of never failing, you know? So and I'm happy you brought that to them because it's a lot of people out there struggling right now. Yeah, you bet. And tap into your network, man. I mean, I've been calling people every day who have more experience in these things than I do and asking for help. Uh, and I even, I even organized a little forum of people running this same kind of business so we could meet every week and talk about how are we taking advantage of relief packages? How are we getting forbearance on our rent? How are we building our businesses for the future? So Whoever your community is in your kind of corner of the real estate market, find those people and, you know, share like never before because uh, we, you know, we really will get through it together. Um, and if, you know, if, if you keep your head buried in the sand the way I had it buried for a couple of weeks, you know, then uh, it, it's not going to serve you. But, I, you know, for me, just throwing my hands up and being like, I need help in these three, four different areas and here's what I can offer. Um, it's really been uh, refreshing for me. That is awesome. Together apart. That's it. That's it. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Ethan, for hopping on. Another great show, Micah. Yes, it was. Thank you for hopping on. Listeners, thank you for continuing to listen to us. Uh, we hope if you are surviving during this time. And remember to be sure to follow Live Let Thrive on IG, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts. YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate the love and thanks for being listeners. We are out. Later. Thank you guys. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Live, Let, Thrive. Be sure to tune in next week for all the latest in the world of Airbnb and all that entails. Bye-bye.